Welcome to this seminar, the first of two on the subject of revival. Now, this is a huge subject and not easy to cover in two seminars. So it will be a little bit like an hors d'oeuvre or an aperitif. It will stimulate your appetite. So although I can't cover it in great depth, I will give you some ways of looking at this wonderful subject and hope inspire faith. The word revival can have different meanings and levels of understanding depending on the context in which it is used. So in everyday life, it can refer to such things as a flagging sports team who seem to be losing, suddenly finding form and bursting into life and turning possible defeat into victory. It can refer to a revival of popularity of something that has become dormant, forgotten, or even died, such as a style of music, art, fashion, political ideology, or anything that was once successful or popular suddenly coming alive once again. The word revival often occurs in Christian vocabulary and 2,000 years of Christian history tells many stories of dormant faith and truths suddenly coming alive. And where Christianity has had little or no influence on the secular world, there have been significant growth spurts that have affected both the church and the world. We can read books describing outpourings of the Holy Spirit and biographies of great men and women being used by God. And this can create a longing for something to happen in our day, for the church to be revived and society changed. At times, through 2,000 years of church history, God has revived and renewed his church with these dramatic interventions and outpourings of the Holy Spirit, long lost truths which for one reason or another had been neglected and they've been revived and restored. Revival is a word that can capture our imagination. There is an instinctive feeling that we need it, but the problem can be that the word is used in so many different ways among Christians, depending upon our background, our theological perspectives and prophetic understanding. <clears throat> to some, Revival would mean evangelistic breakthrough. To others, it could mean more dynamic church meetings with plenty of Holy Spirit activity. To others, it could mean social reform and tr a transformation of society. There are other words that we can use that also describe these phenomena like, for instance, renewal, restoration, and even reformation. Now, a big clue to understanding what revival is should come from the early chapters of Acts after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is in these chapters that we see the formation of the early church with the ministry of Jesus being continued through the apostles and disciples being filled with the Holy Spirit. Although it is a fledgling church, there are all the elements of what God intends his church to look like. And there can be no doubt that its power and impact 
were made on the known contemporary world at the time. Now, as we look at church history, many revivals have focused on a particular truth or practice that has affected their ecclesiology. However, other aspects of truth and practice have not necessarily been revived. So, for instance, the Reformation in the 16th century brought the church back to such basic evangelical truths as justification by faith. And although the Holy Spirit was definitely active, there is not a lot of evidence of the kind of Holy Spirit miraculous activity that characterised the early church. We need to look at the significant characteristics of the early church and bring our understanding of the meaning of the word revival as a revival of how it all began and what is it we are missing today that needs reviving. Now I have counted over 20 distinctive features of the early church, characteristics which made the church look like the prototype church that it was to be. If we are using the word revival in the sense of bringing to life what was established in the beginning, there is a huge challenge ahead. So let's just look at some of those things. Firstly, New birth. The message was salvation. We must be born again. And so new birth characterised the early church. Secondly, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The apostles were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but through the book of Acts and into the epistles, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was a key feature of early church life which led on to supernatural lifestyle, dreams, visions, prophecies, gifts of the Spirit, healings, signs, wonders and miracles. Another feature was the powerful preaching of the gospel accompanied by evangelistic breakthrough. Numbers were thought of in hundreds and thousands Daily, people were added. Whole urban areas affected. So we read about Jerusalem, Samaria, Antioch, Philippi, Ephesus, Corinth. A few years ago, I was on holiday in Greece and went to the ancient city of Philippi and our guide explained these different sites where after the Apostle Paul had proclaimed the gospel there and planted a church, the whole city of Philippi was affected. The establishment of churches, communities, the gathered ecclesia. There was spiritual leadership, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, elders, you remember how in the book of Acts there was a theological debate over the issue of grace and the Council of Jerusalem met together and apostles, prophets and teachers and elders got together to give a lead to the church. There was worship and the manifest presence of God. There was social outreach and care for the poor. Their prayer meetings in the book of Acts were dynamic, so much so that on one occasion the very building shook with the power and presence of God. There was the fulfilling or the beginning of the fulfilling of the Great Commission and there was missionary outreach. Now this one's a bit more difficult. <laughs> there was persecution, martyrdom, and suffering. There was the holiness of life 
and the fear of God. They were a people who were purified. There was a sense of unity. They broke bread together. There were baptisms. Marriage and family life was important. And there was the prophetic vision of Christ's second coming. The early church live as though Christ had died yesterday, rose today and was coming again tomorrow. And there was a sense of urgency looking for the coming of Jesus. There was the priesthood of all believers. So everybody had a part to play. And there was the challenging of the values of an ungodly world and seeing the kingdom affect all aspects of life. So we can ask the question, since the earliest days of Christianity, has there ever been an expression of church living out to the full all of those values and vision? Now, as we consider the last 2,000 years of church history, there have been outpourings of the Holy Spirit that have renewed and revived many of these characteristics. There are revivals that have had a particular emphasis that has been restored. For example, the revival in England and America in the 18th century, labelled by church historians as the first great awakening or sometimes the evangelical revival, would have had a strong emphasis on the preaching of the gospel. In England, the contemporaries John Wesley and George Whitfield were outstanding preachers of the gospel. They broke away from the traditions of a backslidden state church to preach to thousands in the open air. Although these men came from a different theological position, the Arminian Wesley and the Calvinist Whitfield had a mutual honouring and respect and the preaching of both men won thousands to Christ in a Britain that had sunk into terrible depths of degradation after the death of Cromwell and the restoration of the monarchy. Charles II's reign ushered in a new era of flagrant ungodliness. Dalimore, the historian, says... In the violent rejection of Puritanism that accompanied the restoration of the English monarchy, much of the nation threw off restraint and plunged into godlessness, drunkenness, immorality and gambling. Deism became the prevailing philosophy which brought about a vicious thought war against supernatural Christianity, seeking to rationalise everything. The Bible, the virgin birth, miracles, and especially evangelical faith. The church in its weakness was unable to combat this using cold, correct apologetics, which lacked soul and passion. Huge numbers deserted the church, believing Christianity to be false. Into the 1700s, the decade between 1730 and 1740, life in England was morally bankrupt. And there are definite parallels with today. It was into this environment that God raised up John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. Thousands turned to Christ 
and a great revival ensued, which many historians claim saved Britain from the horrors of the French Revolution. At the same time as this, in America, which both Wesley and Whitfield visited, Jonathan Edwards was used mightily by God to bring thousands to Christ. The significant factors in the Great Awakening were the powerful preaching of the gospel and certainly through the influence of John Wesley, the establishment of churches where new converts could be taught and discipled. It would also be true to say that John Edwards was not only a great preacher of the gospel, he was a great theologian as well. Wesley was strongly opposed to the slave trade and this revival sowed the seeds of the abolitionist movement led by Wilberforce. This was a revival that emphasised the preaching of the gospel, establishing churches and affecting social change. It was a significant time in both English and American history. Other revivals followed, which highlighted other aspects of truth to be recovered. Moving on into the next century, we have the second great awakening affecting both America and Britain. Wesley and Whitfield were into in the 1700s. We now go into the 1800s. In 1801, in a place called Cane Ridge on the North American frontier, thousands began to gather as the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the frontier pioneers and settlers. Mendel Taylor in his book, Exploring Evangelism, describes scenes which became typical of other revivals. He says this, The noise was like the roar of Niagara. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated as if by a storm. I counted seven ministers, all preaching at one time, some on stumps, others on wagons, and one standing on a tree which had on falling lodged against another. Some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying out for mercy in the most piteous accents while others were shouting most vociferously. While witnessing these scenes, a peculiar strange sensation such as I had never felt came over me. My heart beat tumultuously. My knees trembled, my lips quivered, and I felt as though I must fall to the ground. A strange supernatural power seemed to pervade the entire mass of mind there collected. I stepped up on a log where I could have a better view of the surging sea of humanity. The scene which then presented itself to my mind was indescribable. At one time, I saw at least 500 swept down in a moment as if a battery of a thousand guns had been opened upon them and then immediately followed shrieks and shouts that rent the very heavens. Now, an objective observer might describe this as mass hysteria. 
but the results in crowds turning to Christ paved the way for other revivals to follow. Another famous name in revival history was just nine years old when the Cane Ridge revival erupted, the one I've just described. His name was Charles Finney. It has been said that Finney was the link between the first great awakening of the 18th century into the second great awakening into the 19th century. Finney trained as a lawyer, but soon left his profession to preach. He had a mighty encounter with the Holy Spirit and his ministry was marked by people demonstrably being convicted of sin through his preaching. He was particularly famous for his lectures on revival, which are still read today. Now, as an Arminian, he strongly believed that if we fulfilled the conditions, God would always send revival. Although Reformed theology would not agree with that premise, there can be no doubt that Finney, with his strong emphasis on conviction of sin, holiness of life, and the power of the Holy Spirit, saw revivals breaking out wherever he went until his death in 1875. The year 1857 was significant with revivals breaking out in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, as well as America. It was these revivals that paved the way for the early years of the 20th century. Great names like D.L. Moody, William Booth, Lord Shaftesbury, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher, all saw incredible breakthroughs of God in the second half of the 19th century. There can be no doubt that the impact of revivals has been felt in the growth of evangelical, spirit-filled Christianity around the world. The missionary thrust in the 19th century was spawned through these years and paved the way for the 20th century. Now, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the 20th century and the emergence of Pentecostalism tended to polarise the evangelical world since such spiritual gifts as tongues, prophecy, healing and other phenomena were not accepted by other evangelicals. Significant in this development was the Azusa Street Revival in America and the Welsh Revival of 1904 to 1906. The Pentecostal movement was birthed from these two revivals, which had their roots in the second great awakening of the previous century. And it was in 1916 that the Pentecostal movement began to move forward. And as a result of that, through the 20s, and 30s through the preaching of great men like George and Stephen Jeffries. In our nation, in the UK, there were thousands turned to Christ in big evangelistic healing crusades that were in the big concert halls and theatres in the country. It was an incredible time. In the 1960s, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that saw many traditional churches being renewed. The word renewal was on many people's lips as the teaching and experience of traditional Pentecostals infiltrated some of the bastions of Anglicanism, the Baptists, the Brethren, 
and even more shockingly to some, the Catholics. The emphasis was placed on renewing the old. However, new wine could not easily be contained in old wineskins and many began to break away with many new churches being formed, often based in people's homes. The 70s and 80s saw a tension between what became known as the charismatic movement and traditional evangelicals. The word renewal began to evolve into restoration. God was not about renewing old wineskins, but restoring the church to its original intention, structures and ministries. Fifty years on from the beginning of the charismatic movement, the body of Christ looks very different with a greater unity and sense of purpose. And whatever shade of evangelical opinion, there seems to be a hunger for something beyond what we are experiencing at the moment. There is a crying need throughout the world for gospel advance. And that can only come about through another great awakening an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will cut across denominations, streams, spheres, or whatever terminology we want to use. We've had reformation, we've had renewal and restoration. The crying need for today's church and world is a mighty outpouring of God's Spirit. The crying need is for revival. In the next seminar, we will look at some of the elements of revival and see how our hearts can be stirred to faith to believe for it. 